Greetings from the Dark Continent, Conscious Caracal here, or Adams Van Sale, and tonight we're not going to be focusing on something specifically South African, but I'm going to be talking to you, two South Africans, about a topic that's been uh, very much hotly debated uh, on social media, and that has been uh, taking over the news cycle. Two topics, actually. The one topic would be Bitcoin, and the other one is Elon Musk, but those two are actually connected, as you'll uh, learn as our conversation tonight goes. I'm talking to Brandon van Niekerk and Ricky Allardyce. Uh, they are the two co-founders of the the bitcoin website or the the website bitvice which is a platform that enables advisors advisors and individuals to purchase and secure bitcoin so before we continue maybe just uh, to let you know there's a little bit of a qr code there in the bottom right uh, of the screen that's uh, something that ricky helped me set up and that's for uh, if you want to donate uh, 10 rands worth uh, through a, a lightning transaction you can just scan that qr code if you have uh, any time type of crypto i think or i think it's only if it works with bitcoin so uh, before we continue or before we uh, get into that maybe or before we get into the main topic um in regards to your website did i sum it up correctly in regards to what it does and what its function is yeah so the website is primarily focused on helping people to just buy bitcoin easily but but immediately self custody it for themselves because the only ways right now is are for to go into exchanges, easily buy Bitcoin I guess. But uh, those exchanges are holding that Bitcoin for you, which means it's an IOU, and this is something inherently sovereign where nobody needs to hold it for you. And there have been cases in the past where there have been billions of dollars of hacks on exchanges. Nigeria, Luna was there. Um, the government locked it down, meaning they locked Bitcoin uh, for all the users. So this is something where you can just hold it yourself. And 75% of Bitcoin, which is around 16 million Bitcoin so far, is held by uh, in a self, self-custodial self manner. And secondly, that's just setting up your own self-custody solution, takes some time and some education. So we've got some advisors working on the platform to help you along the way to just set that up. Uh, hold it for yourself and manage it in your state going forward as it uh, continues to grow in value. Mm. And there is a link in the description if anyone is curious uh, to the Bitvice website, you can go visit it after listening to this conversation. So to start off, Ricky, can you give us the timeline of uh, Mr. Musk's relationship with crypto? Where did it start and uh, how did we get to where we are today before we get into the the more recent news and developments? So... I'm not exactly sure when Elon first found out about Bitcoin, but um, he was making some Bitcoin related tweets probably about hmm, maybe about halfway through last year. So let's let's call it about a year ago. He started making some Bitcoin tweets and clearly he was doing some research on Bitcoin. Um, and then he dropped his tweets probably in the beginning of the year, I think it was, where he said uh, in retrospect, it was inevitable talking about Bitcoin that, you know, obviously him being the alleged genius that he is would come to terms with Bitcoin. Um, and then he started shilling Dogecoin, uh, more recently, which if you know anything about, about crypto, Dogecoin is the shittiest of shit coins. Um, so it's interesting that he, he was shilling that one, but, um, that drove the price of Doge uh, literally to the moon. I mean, Doge has gone up 20, 23,000% this year. It's, it's outrageous. Um, but yeah, so then he um, he also then after that announced that Tesla was putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet. They made a purchase of Brandon correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was 1.5 billion dollars of of Bitcoin that they put onto their balance sheet. And obviously he holds Bitcoin in his personal capacity. Um, and then last week, Elon decided that Bitcoin wasn't environmentally friendly enough for him anymore. And after announcing that uh, Tesla was going to be selling cars, their cars for Bitcoin, they then rescinded that and say we're not accepting Bitcoin anymore. For our cars and that resulted in bitcoiners all over the internet losing their minds and shouting at elon and then elon getting upset because bitcoin is being mean to him um and here we are today mm. so uh, now that ricky has uh, brought us up to speed brandon can you give us a bit more information about the current situation what do you think's going on in the mind of mr musk so i just want to talk about dogecoin quickly dogecoin mm. was created about eight years ago by two just random developers and they created it in two hours. They basically just forked some chain, created some new code. And, and it's, it's, it's a meme. It's a joke that's grown into something like $50 billion now. That's, that's the, that's, a, that's quite a hell of a story. Um, so it's, it, I don't know why he has put so much focus onto something like that. Maybe because he wants to, 
continues to be the king marketer in the world because that's what he is. He's just the best marketer on this planet. And and basically, I don't know. So I think there's just government. There's, there's governments behind the situation trying to push him in, in the direction that they want and into the mandates that they see fit, meaning that central banks want to maintain power over the control of money and they don't like Bitcoin at all because Bitcoin's sole purpose in the world is to kill some central banks. That's his first principle. That's his first goal. That's what it is. Um, and there's a lot of derivatives from that. So because of that and the fact that they don't like Bitcoin, maybe they're saying, Mr. Musk, you're not going to get your subsidies anymore. Mm -hmm. Mr. Musk received about $5 billion of subsidies from the government up to 2016. That was five years ago. Imagine how much more money he's got in the last five years. And, and that's, that's just quite, Tesla, right? That's just Tesla. That's not SpaceX. That's not SpaceX. That's just Tesla. And then we've seen come out about a, uh, an hour ago, China's looking to ban Bitcoin for businesses. Because in, uh, I don't know if this is verbatim, it, it takes control away from the Communist Party. And that's, I mean, that's the point of Bitcoin, right? To take control away from governments. And that's a nice and, advertisement, eh? Yeah. And he really, Mr. Musk really wants to get into China. If you look at the news the past few weeks, that's that's his next biggest goal. So this is all, um, you know, hyperbole, I guess. But but I think uh, a, a lot of the pieces of the puzzle are coming together. Hmm. Uh, Ricky, you want to add something yep. there in regards to the, the what's going on in Elon's head? Yeah, I mean, so Elon is a is a classic cantillionaire, right? Like he's positioned himself close to the money spigot. Um, he benefits from government largesse. Uh, the Biden administration is just uh, they've got a bill tabled at the moment that'll put about 170 billion dollars of spending into electric vehicles in the U.S. 100 million of which will go back in rebates to taxpayers, and the other 70 billion, 15 billion, we use for uh, rolling out electric charging stations. And the remainder obviously goes to the manufacturers. So there's a massive slice of uh, freshly printed bucks that are out there for up for grabs. Um, and I mean, that's probably what he's after, right? Like he's, he's pandering to the only thing that makes his company profitable, second to Bitcoin, which is the government. Um, because Tesla has never turned a profit. Um, they The only way they make money is by getting subsidies. And then when they invested in Bitcoin, they made more return in six months from the investment in Bitcoin than they made in the entirety of all their sales um, in profit. So <clears throat> Elon, um, yeah, I used, sorry, to, I used sorry, to think sorry, that. On that point, Ricky, uh, just to uh, just to elaborate on that, he's, they sold $100 million of Bitcoin about three weeks ago, Tesla did, to meet quarterly targets. So basically, they don't need targets. They weren't selling enough cars. They weren't making enough profit because they, they just can't make profit without the subsidies. Uh, and they yep. sold the hundred million dollars with, I think, about fifty percent of return and net return to meet their quarterly uh, target. So that's why he's still hanging on to Bitcoin. He hasn't <clears throat> sold Bitcoin. Tesla hasn't sold Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, he's a hypocrite, absolutely. So I, I used to think that um, naively that Elon was one of the one of the good billionaires. Um, subsequently, I've scratched his name off that very short list of good billionaires. <laughs> Um, I think it's down to zero now, but um, yeah, he's he's clearly on the on the the take from the from the um, cancelling effect, like get close to the money printer, and he's a hypocrite when it comes to talking about the the uh, carbon footprint of of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to assume that he's so naive as that he doesn't understand Bitcoin because I'm pretty sure he's done his research. He's a smart guy. He knows exactly how it works. I even saw him retweet the the. Um, the white paper that uh, Square and Jack Dorsey commissioned where they speak about how Bitcoin improves the efficiency of re the renewable energy and makes, you know, uh, makes them more viable. And he retweeted and he was like, yeah, this is true. So he totally gets that Bitcoin runs mainly on renewables and uh, improves the efficiency. So the carbon thing is he's just pandering. Um, and then, you know, this coming from a guy who shoots rockets into space um, that use a huge amount of fossil fuels. I don't buy it. He's, he's shit talking. Hmm. Uh, Ricky, um, well, well uh, actually a question to both of you in regards, now that you've mentioned the whole environmental impact uh, matter, 
this is something that's come out not out of the blue but has really been a, not been a point of conversation around crypto really for the past few years and now suddenly um it is the main conversation it's the main topic the environmental footprint and the, it's using all this power um but it was i only briefly saw this type of topic or this type of question and debate surface now and then over the past few years but now it seems to be when you are searching for the uh, the topic that is the main debate that's going to be thrust in your face and why do you why has this suddenly been uh, thrust to the forefront when it comes to crypto it's a it's an indirect narrative sorry Rick, it's an indirect narrative thrown by uh states governments and and the plutocracy because they don't do things directly they do things in a in a subtle manner and that's what's the narrative they're driving uh, and before ricky goes i think it's just important for most listeners to to try and understand why bitcoin uses so much energy before we go into why it's actually not a bad thing and why it needs to Bitcoin, uh, um, there's, there's, there's thousands of miners across the world who are trying to solve a puzzle in order to win a reward of 6.25 Bitcoin every 10 minutes. This puzzle takes a lot of computational power that, that will eventually every around on average 10 minutes, one miner win, wins that. And that's the incentive. So uh, we can dive deep into that, but I don't think we need to. Um, and then we can dive into the energy narrative. So Ricky, over to you. Yeah, so I mean, the en energy narrative has come to the forefront, probably because CNN and the like are trying to push the climate change narrative now that COVID is dying off, um, and they need to have something else to, to make people scared about. But also, it's one of the last remaining pieces of FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, that, that is credible, or has a shred of credibility left um, to argue against. All the other narratives have been crushed already by the fact that Bitcoin is still here and still taking over. Um, but when you when you dig down a little bit deeper into the energy argument, it, it falls flat. Um, the Bitcoin mining network currently consumes about 0.5% of uh, all energy that's produced annually. So when you look at annual Bitcoin energy usage, it uses 0.5% of energy usage. So this is the global. amount of... Yeah, global. so the world, oh, yeah. the, world the, uh, the energy use globally is about 160,000 terawatts per hour. Bitcoin uses 0.5% of that. But also that 160 50 basis points yeah that 160,000 terawatts per hour 60 percent of that is wasted mm. yeah um and it's yeah. a very important figure to remember going forward yeah so on the topic of wasted energy the amount of appliances always on appliances in america just america alone or the energy they consume annually is enough to power the bitcoin network for 1.5 years so just to put into perspective how much energy bitcoin uses relative to other things so we can all agree that always on appliances are probably a bit of a waste of electricity right like so this is the same argument that people are making against bitcoin they're saying oh it's so it's energy intensive it's a waste of energy it's just like some magic internet money okay well like let's let's equate apples with apples here but then if you're the kind of person that thinks that that the world doesn't need a decentralized alternative to fiat currencies or to central banking um then of course you're going to think bitcoin's a waste of energy um, but we're not talking to you. <laughs> we're talking to people who want an alternative. Um, and, you know, w whether or not people scream about energy usage or not actually doesn't matter because Bitcoin does its thing. It carries on. Um, but if you there was a study commissioned uh, last year that had a look at the energy mix that Bitcoin consumes. Now, it's very, very difficult to actually work that out because miners around the world vary their where they buy their energy from some of them pack up their miners and move to different locations seasonally depending on wet season or hydro specifically so the mix is very hard however the low bound estimate range from 35 percent to the upper bound of 76 percent of renewable energy usage for bitcoin mining now that's very high that's higher than the us for example if the the us's energy mix is only 15 percent renewable so bitcoin is twice as in it as uh, green as the us economy so in the worst that, case in the worst yeah. case absolutely um but the the beauty of bitcoin is it's the energy buyer of last resort so what that means is if the if there's nowhere else that you can sell your energy to bitcoin will come and buy that energy from you so what that means there's no other buyers which mean that energy would be wasted and as brandon said um a very very large portion of uh, electricity that's generated is actually wasted um and lost through transmission through inefficiencies um and mainly because large amounts of energy is, is stranded 
um, because you've got to move electricity at high voltage, um, you have to essentially place your energy production quite close to where it's being consumed or else you lose a large amount in the transmission lines. Now, if you have stranded energy resources like a large amount of water in a mountain range, for example, um, how do you generate that hydro and then get it to everyone who needs it? Um, it's, not, it's not always that simple as just plugging it into the grid. And then seasonally, you've got massive changes in the energy output of, let's use the same hydro example, in China, in the dry season, hydro doesn't produce so much energy at all. But in the wet season, it produces double, triple the amount of energy that is required in that area for the electricity. So that water is pumping out of the dam and those turbines are spinning. And if that electricity is not being taken off by the grid, there's not, there's not enough battery or storage capacity to store that energy. So it's literally being wasted. So the Bitcoin miners that plug in, they naturally move to the, the those hydro dams in China and they're going to buy that power for next to nothing, but they are paying for it. They go and take off that energy, which would otherwise be wasted, and then they store it in a essentially a, a, a monetary battery. And that energy can then be shipped anywhere around the world uh, through space and also through time and spent in the future. And it's essentially stored energy. So, so mankind and all his ingenuity has worked out a way to store energy in money, which is essentially what money should be, right? Like it yeah. should be a battery for your time. Um, yes. Yeah, so, 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 so just sorry, Rick, just on on that point, it's like you know, that's another fud or fear, uncertainty, and doubt that people throw in Bitcoin is that you know all the energy, all the mining is done in China. Well, back in the day, a few years ago, it was around eighty percent, and that was actually scary. Now it's down to about forty percent, and you're looking at America now, where there's an incredible growth of miners there that they're moving towards fracking uh, sites, mining sites, what have you. And they're taking this um, this wasted gas that's coming out of vents or whatever you call it. They're taking that flare, using that energy from that from that gas, and they're turning that into Bitcoin. So they're actually taking this this harmful gas that would have been released, and they're turning that into Bitcoin. So it's also, yeah, yes, they're using that energy, but now they're actually saving that um, the world from a lot of uh, CO2 emissions as well. Hmm. Well, the, my one question there in regards to the, this topic of the, the environmental impact of crypto is how long will this uh, this fear cycle last? I mean, I'm old enough to remember all the different types of uh, fear cycles that have gone around Bitcoin with different types of uh, uncertainties and things that people were very worried about at the time and then it disappears. Is this a long term thing or are we going to see yeah. um, it slowly dissipate? Um you know, so it was a, there was an interview with Michael Saylor, who, who's one of the, the forefront leaders. I wouldn't say leaders because Bitcoin doesn't have a leader, but the institutional leaders of Bitcoin. And, and a, a podcast asked him, like, how, you know, will Bitcoin keep going up? And he said forever. And the fear, why I say this, the fear, uncertainty and doubt of Bitcoin, it will be there forever because you've just got everything against it. And you've got the complete, utter elite against it. And they, they are going to throw everything at it. They're going to throw everything at it. And it, unless you have absolute resolve and belief in this, um, you, might get, you might get a bit sick along the way. Otherwise, I mean, you know, we've seen the same things happen in 2017. China trying to ban it dozens of times. They're trying to do it again now. You just can't ban Bitcoin. So I've become so desensitized to the whole thing. I just focus on the fundamentals and carry on with my life. And I think Ricky does as well. And, and, and the experienced Bitcoiners, after going through these deep bear markets and, and going through the, the highs and lows and the ebbs and flows, they, uh, they also become desensitized to it because it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Diamond hands, baby. <laughs> so before we continue on to the, the next topic, uh, is there anything else you want to add to the environmental question, uh, Ricky? <clears throat> yeah, man, I, I, I think the you need to compare it. You need to compare apples with apples, right? Like what is, is Bitcoin, does Bitcoin consume a lot of energy? Yes, it does. There's no denying that. Like it consumes a lot of electricity. But the real question at hand is, is it worthwhile spending for mankind to spend that amount of energy on an alternative to central banking a system in bitcoin that no one controls there's no leader there's a known monetary policy that is set in stone if you try to change that you fork it and you create another coin which then goes on to die a slow and miserable death like bcash you know like it's 
it, you can you you can't change the rules um and the the alternative to that is central banking where the rules get changed all the time it's run by the elites that are connected to it and they use it to enrich themselves and essentially what they what they do <clears throat> is they can print money ad infinitum to fund their pet projects and fund their wars and 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 use that that the ability to control the printing press against you so if you don't like that um then buy bitcoin and and get involved run a node you know like the 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 cost of energy is is immaterial um really because we, it's never going to consume all the world's energy like these these guys are postulating that's not how that's not how it works um yeah. is, i mean is so there room is it sorry brandon is, is there enough room for us to have multiple proof of work chains i don't think so there's room for having one proof of work chain that is the global protocol that everyone runs their monetary network on and they can build you know different systems on top of that which use less energy um but uh ultimately i think it's worth it to have essentially the, the something that can bring us much closer to world peace because governments can't fund wars by printing money anymore i think that's a net win for society mm. and, and talking about uh, the, how propaganda is used against uh, the things that you fear i'm just waiting and, and wondering how long it's going to be for the anc to start saying that uh, every forums every forums operations is bad for the environment <laughs> um so i mean it's, uh, it's every like, forum what? uses service they should put their paper on the floor like they do at the central firearms registry that's much better for the environment yeah. Yeah. i think let's let's just go back a second and, and you know we're saying bitcoin uses so much energy and all these miners are solving puzzles but you know what's the bigger scheme of it why why is it so important to use so much energy right first of all let's look at the indirect factors so, i mean 10 percent of global wealth on average is destroyed every year through inflation through Keynesian economics and central banks printing relentless money and that's that's the fact worldwide because every single country has, a, has the exact same model of the federal reserve um you know money monetary their monetary policies they like generate business cycles as you've seen over like eight years um on average that's that absolutely destroy capital at the end and then you need to start start off new and um, it's just you just have a system of infinite wasteful government spending that hurts the lower and middle class over and over again and you've seen this since 1971 and you've actually just seen this as the beginning of, t of mankind's history how inequality continues to grow and and yes you might think it's because of socio-economic policies but i believe you know the federal reserve the South African Reserve Bank and all the others, they're above the, the government. That's where the actual problems stem from and then they flow, flow down. And this is why Bitcoin is like our last step in hope, I believe. And, you know, looking at the centralized systems, it's very hard to look at these systems and determine the truth because it's decentralized. There's no central point like a visa back end that's telling you exactly what transactions happened right in this kind of system proof of work which is bitcoin's fundamental like algorithm through all their energy use and all that work it's the only way in a decentralized manner to determine the truth and that's why proof of work is the only way a blockchain can work proof of work is is like where you trust mathematics and you trust physics to determine what happened there's no human process in it whatsoever then you get things like ethereum which is called proof of stake and basically it's just like banks meaning proof of stake is meaning the more you like ethereum you have under a node the more you have the more voting power you have it's the exact same thing as banks and governments like <laughs> they're just creating the same thing over on, the, on some on some new like architecture it's absolute bullshit. and and in that process is that where you need to trust humans to disperse funds and all that so i really i really implore people to really think about you know do you need ten thousand blockchains or do you just need one did you ever need ten thousand internets or did you ever need one um and that's why we only focus on bitcoin mm. yeah yeah uh maybe just before we uh this wasn't a, a massive topic that i wanted to discuss but it just came to mind uh ricky can you just explain uh, now that uh, brandon has talked about uh, the whole idea of having one uh cryptocurrency why has the crypto market just exploded with all these little tiny coins 
that uh, are basically worth nothing, but people are actually investing real money in it and seem to be trading it on a daily basis. Uh, what's going on there? So there's, there's two reasons for that. First reason is someone looks at Bitcoin and without spending a large amount of time and speaking to the, the, the standing on the shoulders of giants that have come before, they just automatically assume, oh, Bitcoin's confirmation time is too slow and the fees are too high, so I'm going to build a better Bitcoin. And they go and try to build another coin out of out of pure ignorance of of why Bitcoin has been designed the way it's been designed. That, so there's that group of people. The second group of people are shitcoiners who understand that perfectly, and they know the game. The game is to create a new coin to get people to pay them in Bitcoin for that new shitcoin they've created, and they run away with people's Bitcoin. Uh, that's that's essentially the two <laughs> the two camps they fall into. So I mean, most most I'm going to say let's say 60% of shitcoins are, exist as scams to steal your Bitcoin, to enrich the founders. Um, and that's exactly what we see happening. So many of them have just, if from 2017, um, are pretty much dead now. There's no much more, de no more development happening. The, the teams have dissipated. But all the Bitcoin that, was, that people used to buy those coins over time um, has now moved to the hands of the founders and developers and the, the, you know, the early investors, et cetera. So people basically got, got scammed. Um, and then the guys building the all the other coins, I mean, they are trying to develop a new Bitcoin, but they misunderstand that network effects are winner take, you know, it's a winner take all protocol walls or winner take all thing. Um, so they they're going to lose. And even if they were moderately successful um, and they start threatening central banks because they are centralized and because there's a founding team and a known development team around them and a, and a cult of personality around the founder like Vitalik, they'll just be shut down. You know, the government will just go to them and shut them down like they shut down Libra when Facebook was trying to launch their own coin. Um, they, so they're centralized points of failure. So effectively, I see them mainly as being pointless. Um, in the short term, people speculate on them. And this is one thing that's always amazed me about, about crypto. And I was guilty of this myself when I first got involved is that in no other realm in your life when you're investing in unit trusts or, you know, you're buying gold or whatever, no, you never decide, oh, I'm going to start trading ETFs when I get into my own, when I start buying an RA for myself or unit trust, no one makes that decision. But when they get into crypto, they all of a sudden think they have to become a trader. And then the altcoins become attractive because they see the massive gains and the massive volatility on a, on a short term basis. And that's like a siren song to them. Unfortunately, 99% of people who try their hand at trading lose money over the over the medium to long term. Um, but you know, like I had to, like Brandon had to go through that cycle, you've got to, you've got to do it, you've got to burn your hand on the stove. And realize, oh, this is this is a waste of capital and my time. Um, I should be focusing on what I'm good at and storing my value in Bitcoin. And it's that easy. Yeah. All right. And uh, but talking about uh, the crypto volatility and playing the markets and speculating, currently Bitcoin seems to be a bit, uh, bit in a downward spiral in regards to the price. Brandon, can you enlighten us in regards to where are we currently on the the Bitcoin timeline, if you will, in regards to what's going on uh, for people on? On, on the outside looking in and also people that just got into crypto. Sure. So I, I think based on historics, we've seen a very similar pattern play out over and over again in Bitcoin cycles since 2009. What Bitcoin follows is basically its halving cycle, meaning every four years, its supply, every, its supply is, is, is cut in half. It's a, it's a, it's a deflationary asset. Um, in nature. And because of that, there's normally a supply shock that's delayed somewhat by six months. And because of that supply shock, there's no more willing sellers left. There's no more liquidity left. And then you see the price trajectory go up. In 2017 um, and, and 2013, those are the, the bull markets. And they normally lasted about a year with like a three year. And then, and, and then before that's normally a three year bear to mid bear um, cycle, basically. Mm. We're in the mid middle, basically, of the current one year bull market based on historics. And in 2017, you saw Bitcoin go down 35% over that year, leading up from about $800 to $1,000 to $20,000. Four times it went down 35%. We're currently down from the, the high around 35% towards 40%. So it's, it's nothing alarming at all. Basically, since February or March, 
we are in a consolidation period because we went up very quickly, too, too quickly in my opinion. And right now it's just shaking out the weak hands, uh, the people who, the speculators, um, like it does um, all the time. And then once again, the strong hands will form the base and will start its next leg up. The, the macroeconomic indicators there uh, are still there. You know, Biden's about to, to print about $3 trillion per quarter uh, for $3,000 stimulus bills for, for millions of people. Uh, so, so other governments about to print relentlessly. Uh, institutions will carry on buying this deflationary assets to, to cover their, uh, the loss of the US dollar in the reserves. Um, nothing's changed those fundamentals whatsoever. It's just a consolidation period, in my opinion. Um, and it's a great, it's a little nice dip to buy. Um, and I did yesterday. Hmm. So, uh, Ricky, think, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, yeah I, I think it's ironic that, so Bitcoin was um, developed in 2009. The white paper was, was released. Um, and a few months later, the first block was mined. And in the first block, you can write a message in a in a transaction and in the first block it said the um the but essentially the minister of finance of the uk the the exchequer um is on the brink of bailing out banks um essentially meaning that the uk is starting to print money right um and so here we are you know 11 years later uh, 12 years later and um we in another crisis and they're printing more money than anyone ever imagined could be possible to print in 2008 um bitcoin was designed for this like this is the time to shine and if you've got weak hands and are selling your bitcoin now you don't understand the reason why it exists you know it's it's literally it's insurance against irresponsible money printing if the government wasn't irresponsible with the with the money printer you wouldn't need bitcoin um so yeah we're not particularly worried about about this uh dip this consolidation we're seeing at the moment it's shaking out the elon fanboys that's great it hasn't shaken out elon though i must know he didn't sell his bitcoin which makes me know that he's he's triple dipping um and he's uh <laughs> he's, he doesn't believe his own bullshit. if he really believed his had conviction in what he said he would sell his own bitcoin but clearly he doesn't care about the environment that much yeah so just just to add to ricky um you know why is it the antithesis of of money printing it's because Bitcoin is literally the scarcest asset that mankind has ever created. There will only ever be 21 million of them by the year 2140. Um, and, and nothing can change that. And, and basically, it's the only asset in this world, the only one, where the supply can never be affected by, the, by demand. Because if, if gold, if, if demand and price went up, people would find a way and put more capital uh, to, to, to uh, mine more. But with Bitcoin, no matter how much mining power you put towards it, because of the algorithm, the difficulty adjustment algorithm, you can't change the supply. It will still give you 6.25% uh, 6.25 Bitcoin every 10 minutes. And that's the pure, pure beauty about it. Mm. And uh, in regards to people uh, getting into the market now, uh, Brandon, you said you just bought some recently, as recently as yesterday. Um, would you think that the correction is going to uh, dip a bit more? Or do you think, uh, what does the, the short term future hold in regards to the price? I honestly don't know. Uh, but I do know it'll go to $100,000. Mm. That's what I know. But I don't know where, how far down it'll go. Well, the nice thing for you is your prediction is now immortalized on the stream and probably on uh, some of your podcasts as well. So maybe uh, you can be very smug uh, in, a, uh, in the future. Um, Ricky, I wanted to ask you in regards to uh, while we were still talking about Elon, um, some people have mentioned that isn't it a disadvantage of Bitcoin that the price can so easily be affected by the social media postings of uh, the big guys that are invested in it? Now, I'm also not under the delusion thinking that uh, it's completely just Elon that's uh, driving this entire dip right now. But uh, what is your answer to that type of sentiment that uh, it is an inherent weakness of Bitcoin, that it can be so easily manipulated by the big guys out there that uh, can just post a tweet and then send everything into disarray? I mean, it is what it is. Um, you know, the, the, the something can't go from being a white paper and a, a science experiment to being global reserve currency. You know, overnight, it doesn't it doesn't go from from zero to one like that. It's, there's a continuum of how adoption proceeds. You know, um, so money has got to go through these phases. And ultimately, this is very good for Bitcoin. This is the best thing Bitcoin could ask for. Is because the only way Bitcoin gets stronger is by constantly being attacked. 
and it has been constantly attacked and it's every time it gets the next level's boss and elon is the boss we're at now you know so the bitcoin's fighting fighting elon um yeah and ultimately sorry, it's gonna sorry, win Ricky. sorry okay i mean back in 2017 we had um some leaders of bitcoin who who betrayed it i mean bitcoin's in a constant state of betrayal and those two yeah. were like vinnie lingham right so it's african guy that i mean not a lot of people know him and roger ver and many other um shit coiners i guess uh and nobody knows him anymore so th that's what that was that level and they, these were you know mid-level millionaires and they were affecting the markets they, how did they betray <laughs> bitcoin uh, I so mean, they, they, they tried to create a new Bitcoin with high transaction fees and all that and basically fork the block, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and yeah, they created and, Bcash. And, and that was that was not accepted by the market. The open free market accepted Bitcoin core like it, it has always. And that was one of the biggest fights or, or, or battles I've ever had to go through the block war battles, uh, the yeah. block size battles. And, but basically, my point is, We've just gone up a level now because institutions are buying it because like real real billionaires the richest people in the world are interested in it. those are like the new you know the the new battles we need to go through and and the next cycle in 2024 we see this because we will it's just maths um you'll see yep. nation states against it you'll see literally the american yep. government stating full on blown war against it i, th I really think it's going to get to that point. so you, you're saying we're in the corporate yep. phase now yeah, that's yeah what, that's absolutely life. so so what happened in 2017 just provided a bit of context is a handful of millionaires um who were very pre uh, prominent in the bitcoin community i mean roger ver was called bitcoin jesus um which ironically should have been called bitcoin judas but uh anyway he went on to create bcash and they co-opted 85 percent of mining power of the bitcoin mining network to try to support bcash um and they failed and they got absolutely destroyed by it because they put them took the money out of bitcoin and put it in bcash and bcash is now worth a fraction of what bitcoin is um and they got they got taken out you know um and i only hope the same happens to elon um he'll be the second south Af famous south african to try to attack it and get destroyed so um yeah but it's it's ultimately like the next the next level we go through like is as as um, Brandon says is the nation state battle. So who's going to attack Bitcoin? Which nation state is going to attack Bitcoin? And when that when that fight happens and that nation state gets destroyed by Bitcoin or they come off financially second best, it's going to be a beautiful thing. And it, it only makes Bitcoin stronger. And, and it has spent its entire life in the fire. Um, and this is what we need for it. And it, it, it needs it needs, uh, you know, toxic ma maximalists to to defend it and it needs the intolerant minority to, to you know run a run a bitcoin node which is basically you running a version of of bitcoin um and you validating blocks or well, not validating blocks but you, you know you checking that miners are doing what they're supposed to do with a little personal computer running in the background at home and that's really who controls bitcoin as node operators yeah, um, what I find the interesting biggest... is that uh, Bitcoin sounds a lot like Fainbos, uh, the the type of uh, uh, vegetation that you find in the Western Cape that needs wildfires to be able to be revitalized. Mm. Yeah, that's the that's type that almost burnt my house down a month ago. We do, we do, we do need it though. Mm. Um, we've actually got a question here from uh, from the audience. Sideliner Opinions asks, what prevents governments from taxing Bitcoin heavily with capital gains tax with creative legislation? So, so they are taxing it very heavily in America. They just increased capital gains on cryptocurrencies. It hasn't passed uh, the house, but it's going to be around 80%. Okay. So there are many countries and I think South Africa will be one of them because we're seeing our tax rates go higher and higher because they just have no more money left. Um, and they will tax you upon capital gains uh, events, meaning when you sell your Bitcoin for rand, meaning when you change your Bitcoin to Ethereum or vice versa. Those are taxable events. And, and there are countries in the world, such as Portugal, uh, Germany, uh, and, and, and other Japan. countries. Which one? Japan. Japan. Uh, who, don't, who don't tax it um, anymore. Because they, want, they understand how much capital is in this trillion dollar asset now. And they want that capital to come to those countries. So talking ahead now, once again, to the 2024 nation states versus Bitcoin. You're going to see the judiciary, I mean, judicial ob, um, arbitration game theory play out. There are going to be countries that go, well, bring your money here. I'm not going to ban Bitcoin. Yep. And that's, that's the beauty of it because Bitcoin is everywhere. 
no no central point owns a no government there's no you don't need to have politics around it a government can choose to say i want bitcoin yeah i want your investments yeah and that's what's going to play out and that's why, why whoever fights it, right? that's why whoever fights it is going to lose eventually um this is why it's it's on an eventual path to like the world world reserve currency i believe mm. and, uh, Ricky, and your um, thoughts also on that audience question yeah so i mean this is why tax havens exist right like the can some countries push up their tax rates and naturally other countries there's game theory between nation states permanently um one country pushes up their tax rate another drops them because they want to attract that investment and uh tax havens by deep by default are the freest some of the freest places on earth because to have low taxes you have to have a small government and if you have a small government people are free um so naturally those are places people want to go to and where people are free the economy is more productive everyone has a better standard of living so those countries with high taxes, you know, kind of drag themselves down. Um, but as so far as plebs who don't have the money to go and buy a, a foreign passport in, in the Caribbean somewhere where you have no capital gains tax, Bitcoin is peer-to-peer. -peer. So if people adopt Bitcoin as their internal, you know, uh, monetary unit of account, they can transfer to each other peer-to-peer -peer, um, in a decentralized network that the government has no control over or no sight over. Um, so they the tax codes will be shown to be impotent for what they are. I mean, murder is illegal, rape is illegal, government corruption is illegal. I mean, that doesn't stop it from happening in South Africa every day. So um, government can write laws, doesn't mean they can enforce them. Yeah, so just if you if the uh, the viewer was asking like, how can you be as effective as possible with this instrument and not be taxed heavily? The only way is to is to have a long term horizon on it to hold it as long as possible and not sell it. And if you believe it's going to go up perpetually, um, you won't be taxed on it until the point maybe when, when you when you have a lot of Bitcoin and it's high in Rand or dollar value, you know, go to a place where you won't get taxed for it when you sell it for a nice house. That's uh, if he was he or she was asking that question. Mm. Um, in regards to uh, the, the whole idea of the future you just told you just talked about uh, holding it for long and for the long term is there any other angle or any other uh piece of insight that you also want to share in regards to the future of bitcoin that you think uh, the listeners might find interesting in regards to where are we for example going what where will bitcoin be in a decade or in 20 years or in five years what uh, what are some interesting things on the horizon i i so really I, believe I, Sorry, Ricky. I, I really believe that um, Bitcoin will be held by nation states in their treasuries. It'll, it'll evolve to that point because uh, the current system with uh, perpetual inflation via money printing can't carry on. It will reach a critical mass and there will be some resets of some kind and you will need a deflationary asset in reserves. And that's when you're looking at what you know most Bitcoiners call like hyper Bitcoinization. That's, that's, that's the kind of point. You've gone past institutions you've gone past uh, bond liquidity moving to bitcoin you've gone to countries holding in reserves like russia and all them you you're looking at at that point you know international trade being settled in bitcoin because it is an instant instantaneous settlement instrument so that's that's where that's the future that i see but i'm more and more excited about bitcoin's network being utilized to help many many countries around the world when you look at remittances such as countries as uganda or in Central America, whatever, they are charging 20% to send $10 home. Um, you know, someone works in El Salvador and they want to send money home to their mother and they want to send $10. Eventually, after all these transaction fees, the mother's ending up with like $6. Um, and that's, that's, that's a, lot of, a lot of margin. That's a terrible thing that's happening. With Bitcoin's network, you can now move money. You can change um, dollars or whatever do uh, currency into Bitcoin and then back into any other currency via providers such as Strike and there's going to be a plethora of them. You can move money instantaneously within microseconds from any bank account to any bank account within seconds and at no cost to the user because on this, le on this specific uh, platform, that provider is making money on the back end with liquidity providers. And uh, it's a bit technical, but basically now they can send $10 net. And, and those are the kind of beauty, uh, beautiful things we're going to see. We're going to see the Forex market, which is $5 trillion of volume per day. Um, that's going to be disrupted 
incredibly by uh, Bitcoin's second layer Lightning Network, where you can now change dollars to euros instantaneously for no for no cost. Um, and that's what I'm. That's where like billions and billions and billions of dollars of of real capital is going to be invested, and a lot of um, new jobs are going to be made, and and a lot of innovation is going to be made. Mm. Uh, Ricky, your thoughts on the future? Yeah, man, the the technology is what is what I'm really excited about. So, for example, this QR code in your bottom right corner here, that's a Lightning invoice. So that's utilizing the second layer on top of Bitcoin to pay using the Lightning network, which is instant and is essentially free. So someone can scan that with their Lightning wallet and send you 10 rands worth of Satoshis instantly um, at no cost themselves. And this is where, where Bitcoin goes from being a settlement layer. The, the layer one of Bitcoin is a, is a global settlement layer, final settlement, which is akin to me giving a bar of gold to you. That's final. Um, whereas Lightning is taking, how do we make that process and take tiny fragments of gold, essentially, that we can send across the world instantly at no cost um, while you're leveraging Bitcoin's massive security, which is which is driven by all the energy it consumes. Um, so that's really exciting. And then the privacy side of the network, which is being developed, we're looking at Taproot activation being, they're looking at activating it right now. We're in the middle of that process. Um, what that means is we get massive privacy gains um, on the Bitcoin network, and we also get more efficiency. So on-chain fees go down as well. Um, but the privacy one is great because if, if there's chain surveillance is a, is a thing now um, where governments are effectively paying companies to surveil the Bitcoin blockchain and try to derive as much information as possible because they're not going to take this lying down. Um, and you've got to protect your, your privacy. Everyone's got the right to financial privacy. Um, if I go and pay for a, a cup of coffee or a car or a house or anything with Bitcoin, um, currently I can look at the blockchain and see all of the previous transactions that that address made and how much Bitcoin is held in those wallets. And I don't want my barista knowing how much Bitcoin I've got because next next minute he follows me home and hits me on the head with a stick and takes my Bitcoin. Um, so if everyone has a right to privacy, everyone has a right to financial privacy, um, and the Bitcoin community is actively building those tools out. So I'm very excited about that. Mm. Um, we have a question here from the audience uh, asking, please explain the savings option and how financing th uh, through Bitcoin works. Um, I don't really understand, but... Okay, so I'll, is... I'll take this one. <clears throat> yeah. So, so the savings option, I'm assuming they're referring to like on Luno where the, you can deposit your money into a savings, Bitcoin savings account and they pay you interest on your Bitcoin huh. um, and how that financing works. So um, if I'm correct in, in assuming that's what you mean, effectively what they do is they take your Bitcoin on deposit and they loan it out to an institution. And that institution is 99% of the time trading with your Bitcoin. Um, and then they're generating a return and then they pay you interest from those returns. So effectively what you're doing is you're risking your Bitcoin. Now, if you've got whatever, pick a number's worth of Bitcoin and you put it into a savings account because you're enticed by the three to 5% returns you're making, you really need to consider the risk you're taking with the scarcest asset on earth for 5%. Because you look at your Bitcoin value. It's not, it's with, not even 5%, it's like 2%. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's like 2%. 2%. Yeah, but look at your Bitcoin value currently with 10x glasses on because and then think about your risk. Are you willing to risk 10 times what you got there for three to five percent returns? Most of you would, would say no. Um, so be, just because those those uh, savings plans haven't none of them have, have imploded yet or, or gone south, they will. Some of them will. It's bound to happen. This is an unregulated market. Um, it effectively is the Wild West. Buyer beware. So if you're putting your money up into a savings account, if you're putting your Bitcoin up, don't put your entire stack in there. I would say if you are going to do it, limit your exposure and be aware that the, the risk you're running of losing your money is is not zero at all. Um, yes. And yeah, uh, so people are trading with your Bitcoin. Yeah, there's counterparty risk there, right? Um, mm -hmm. Bitcoin, if you hold it yourself in a self-custodial manner, you don't have any self um There's no counterparty risk. The only risk is this view of losing your private keys or whatever. But I mean, there's so many solutions out there that makes it very hard for you to do that. And and that's what, you know, Bitvice is about. We're trying to educate people just to buy Bitcoin, custody it for themselves, and just keep it for yourselves the long term. Right now, on average, since its inception, Bitcoin has about 200% return year on year on average against the dollar. 
I mean, to me, that's that's more than enough. I'm very happy with that. I don't need to, to get an extra yield of 3% uh, in order to give my Bitcoin to someone. Where at any instance in time, because this is not a fully regulated product, although it is legal to buy, that the government go, uh, no, we don't like this. We're switch, uh, switching this off. And now people can't withdraw their Bitcoin from exchanges and it's locked. And that's happened in Nigeria overnight with, with not even 24 hours of notice. I mean, how do you think it's people happened, should happened, really... happened to me. Yeah, it, it will. I, I'm pretty sure if you're looking at our government and, and what they do with it, everything they do, it's a pretty good chance that that could happen as well. So just hold this asset and, and, and keep it in your own um, self-custodial structure. And you can go and do with it whatever you want. They can never take it from you. No one can ever take it from you. Um, and that's yep. the importance yep. of it. It's not that risk against that 3% yield it's just not worth it, in my opinion. It's not worth it. What you're trying to do is build generational wealth here. You're trying to you're trying to set your great grandchildren up with enough money that they won't have to worry about about money again. And people think, okay, but I don't have that much money. I can't do it. Listen, if you put away a thousand rand a month into Bitcoin for ten years, there's a calculator called DCABTC.com. You can go and look how much you would have made if you had have just put a thousand rand, a hundred rand, whatever a month away. And look at your returns over the last five years. Yours is a game-changing amount. So stay humble, stack sats, just accumulate on the monthly. Don't trade. Don't risk your money with interest-bearing accounts, and just keep it yourself. And take like a 10, 20-year time horizon on this, and um, that's how you build generational wealth. Uh, I'm sorry to inform you that I'm uh, going to have to cut you off by five minutes, seeing as I have load shedding at six. So I'm going to give you uh, one chance each to uh, give you me uh, your final thoughts on uh, the topics that we discussed today, and then also to uh, plug your website. You go ahead, Ricky. Yeah. So I think the main takeaway people should, should take from this is that what is the what is Bitcoin competing against? It's competing against the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency. The U.S. dollar is propped up by its relationship with with Saudi Arabia and oil. The fact that the whole world is forced to buy oil um, using dollars, so effectively have the petrodollar, and the environmental cost of the petrol, the petrodollar. The U.S. military uses more oil than most small countries. Um, the the amount of damage that is wrought by through inflation and through unnecessary wars and having bombs dropped on people by the petrodollar is vast. So when you're comparing, you know, the energy use of Bitcoin. Um, that peaceful revolution, compare it against the petrodollar and, and all the damage that causes. And then you you know, might think differently about the energy use of Bitcoin. Yeah, and, and just from my side, like going once again to the importance of Bitcoin, it's proof of work algorithm and why it uses so much energy. It's similar in, in, in a person. Like the more, you, the more work you put into Bitcoin, the more you understand it. Um, then you'll then you'll get it and you'll understand the importance and you just got to put in the work and and most people are incentivized by just putting in a thousand rand, two thousand rand. Eventually, once they have a little bit of fingers in the pie, that's when they're incentivized to learn more about it. Um, and, and I implore people to do that. You know, really really look at this thing and 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 start to question the system around them because right now this is our best bet. Mm. All right, and Brandon, I'm going to ask you also to uh, just uh, plug your website and your podcast. There are links in the description uh, so people can know where to find you. Yeah, thanks, thanks. And so, just once again, you can go, you can buy Bitcoin uh, from www.bitvice.io. And what you do is you set up, and we help you to set up your own wallet where you can immediately receive that Bitcoin. We never self custody it for you. Um, and that's the whole point of it. So we're not like a traditional exchange that keeps Bitcoin on your behalf. Um, you can also find our pod course, podcast called By the Horns. And we're on Google, we're on Apple, we're on Spotify, and we're also on YouTube, and we release every week. So just try to try and teach people uh, as much about the fundamental, fundamentals of Bitcoin as possible. Mm. Uh, and then also maybe uh, so people know in, on the last episode uh, I was a guest there so if you want to go maybe uh, test their podcast out you can go listen to the last episode where I was a guest uh, thank you very much Ricky and Brandon for uh, your valuable time thank you very much for uh, shining some light on a very complicated to some topic and a topic that a lot of that is inspiring a lot of fiery debate online 
Um, I learned a lot during this discussion. I enjoyed it thoroughly. And thank you also very much to everyone that tuned in. Thank you for your questions and your comments. I know uh, five o'clock in the afternoon is a bit of an unorthodox time. So I think most people are going to be watching this afterwards. Um, but then also just uh, if you want to uh, give a, a crypto tip, there's that, uh, that lightning uh, QR code there in the bottom of the screen. Um, but I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the evening. If you are new to this channel, you can also click subscribe if you like these types of conversations and uh, if you also leave a like that's going to help out the show quite a bit so cheers guys have a good one and god bless cheers thanks guys, thanks, guys.